So I know I'm wearing the same sweater as last week, <laughs> but I'm filming this on the same day. I'm still talking about Columbia. So I only have one Columbia sweater right now. I don't know if I'm gonna get more because this thing is like $60. Bruh. With that out of the way, hello everyone. Welcome back to my channel where we talk about whatever I feel like talking about. And occasionally I make some sense. Last week, I gave you a brief overview of what you, as an undergrad or perhaps a recent college graduate, can do to get into your dream graduate program. But what if you're planning on applying to grad programs next year or the following year? What's the process like? What are the ad comms looking for? And for those of you who don't know, admissions committee is next year still going to be as competitive as the bloodbath that was 2022. <laughs> but for those of you that are new around these parts of YouTube, who am I? What qualifications do I have to guide you guys in the process of graduate school application? My name is Bianca and I am currently making six figures at a biotech startup, but I am giving it all up for a barely livable stipend and one of the most most expensive cities in the world to attend Columbia's neuroscience PhD program. But how exactly did it get into Columbia? Today, I'll take you through my application and I'll take you the juicy details about what schools ghosted me and why I will never get into Harvard. So the first thing to consider when you're applying, whether for master's or for PhD, is what programs do I actually want to apply to? Now, many just say, Apply everywhere, cast a wide net, and then you'll be fine. You'll get accepted somewhere. And first of all, that's, that's hella expensive. Each app can cost anywhere between 80 to $130. You apply to 10 schools, that's 1K. If you don't want to sell a kidney to pay for your grad apps, you need to stratify your application process. You need to do research. Look at programs and see what gets you interested. What type of research do they do? How many professors are on the faculty roster? What type of resources do they have? And what is their funding situation like? Do they make you TA courses? And what is the stipend like relative to the cost of living? Are you going to be happy? And regardless of how amazing the program is, if you'll hate your life while pursuing grad school, whether because you hate the location or maybe the stipend won't give you the quality of life that you want, you won't be motivated to actually do your work. Grad programs, and especially PhDs, are a marathon, not a sprint. So go somewhere that will challenge you intellectually, give you good opportunities, but will also let you live a good life. And obviously that changes depending on the person and their values and their preferences. And there will probably be some things that you need to cut back on. There is no way that I can afford daily takeout and $5 lattes on a PhD stipend. But if you're okay with that, then go for it. And after you identify programs that you're really interested in and pay attention to this point, identify what the program values. And I only realized this after applying, but program fit is actually a major part of the admissions decision. If your program is more mechanism focused, but you're a translational guy, they won't have the faculty to place you with even if you're the most qualified candidate. Pay attention to the fit. What type of students are they looking for? What type of faculty do they have? Are there at least three faculty members that do the research that you're interested in? And conversely, would they be interested in your research experiences? Like it or not, not every faculty member that you see on the website will have the funding or time to take on new students. And even if your resume is the most OP, <laughs> Harvard may not accept you. Yeah if they don't have the faculty that are accepting students with your area of interest. And this is incredibly important for writing your SOP, or Statement of Purpose. Step one to applying to grad school is narrowing down your schools and writing the corresponding Statement of Purposes. Each school is looking for something different in their student body, and this is all listed in the websites. Go through each tab, article, whatever is written on the website and note down what they value. This will help you determine if that fit component is there. In your statement of purpose, you want to emphasize how you personally fit into the school. You want to show them how you embody not only the qualifications to succeed in their program, 
but also their values as a community member. We've experienced this into your writing that will show the characteristics of a student that they're looking for. Utilize your experiences to show that you're an independent researcher. The way that I went about my SOP was treating it more like a job application and not an undergrad common app essay where I dreamed about being a researcher since I was in my mother's womb. <laughs> Last week, we talked about how admissions committees are looking at the prospective student's potential capacity for independent research. Will they be able to drive a project? In your statement of purpose, you can show adcoms that you're already doing independent research. What was the scope of the project or project? Why was that particular scientific question needed? How does it fit into the larger field? What struggles or setbacks did you experience and how did you solve those problems? Who did you reach out to when you were stuck? Can you talk about experiences that showed collaboration in a tangible manner? Don't just say that you're independent and collaborative and creative and passionate and other academic buzzwords. Show experiences where you embodied those characteristics. Now, some graduate programs will ask you for multiple essays and others will just ask you for one. Sometimes you have a statement of purpose and a research statement, which are apparently different things and other schools consider a statement of purpose as something different than another school. So you have to tailor each essay to each program. Because again, you wanna show just how well you fit into this program. Sometimes you can copy and paste, but it's pretty obvious if you do that for all of your programs. But how do you fill your statement of purpose with the great experiences that will show your capabilities as an independent researcher? You need to have a good CV and tough love coming up right now, but in order to get into competitive programs, you need a competitive curriculum vitae. Graduate programs are getting record numbers of applications, and unfortunately, your CV is one of the first things that filter you out. You need to show a good impression on paper to get the opportunity to wow admissions committees with your interview skills. Now, each program is different, and each domain of study is different, and will require different things. I'm in STEM, and in particular, neuroscience. My CV will need to have a lot of wet lab research and ideally some publications and poster presentations to be competitive. Whereas if you're more theory-based, it may be different. If you're more computational, you may have more programming or more projects that you can put on your CV instead. And again, this varies by school. So the only thing that we as applicants can do is to do the best we can, make ourselves the most competitive that we can, and be okay with potentially not getting in. The programs that you get rejected from isn't a measure of your capabilities or your worth as a scientist or your worth as a human. Sometimes it just comes down to luck and will never be a fly on the walls of the admissions committee. So we literally can't know why we got accepted or why we got rejected. So just try your best and you'll get into a place that fits you and your research interests. And maybe it'll take a couple of times. This is my second time flying and that's okay. Just do what you can, be okay with the process, and hopefully you'll get into a program that you're happy at. And now this is the portion of the video where I will show you a very heavily blurred out CV because I don't want to reveal all my personal information on the internet. I'm sure you can Google me if you really want to and corroborate everything that I'm saying. Maybe I shouldn't have told you guys to do that. Here's my CV. This is not actually my CV. I forgot to print it out. This is actually my um, company's, uh, what is it? Company stocks information. <laughs> My CV is personally three pages long, which is fairly standard for a STEM CV. And I, I've said this a couple of times, but if you don't know what a CV is or what a curriculum vitae is, it's basically a more comprehensive resumes. Now resumes should be around one page and show only the most relevant experiences, whereas CVs can be much longer. And they actually get longer as you get more experiences, as you get more sections that you can put on it. Papers, publications, talks, patents, if that's something that you're able to do, techniques, anything else that you can actually put on there. So my CV has a few sections. We got education, because I am applying for higher education programs, work experience, volunteer experience, publications, posters, talks, and a section for technical skills and programs that I personally know how to use. And like the statement of purpose, you want to tailor your CV to what your school values. And this is true for job positions too. If you're applying to a clinical job, you need to modify the way that you explain your roles 
to emphasize the characteristic and the skills that a clinician will look for in a successful candidate. If you're applying for more industry jobs, you want to emphasize miniaturization, assay development, and whatnot, the things that the industry company wants to capitalize upon. So in my education section, I have my undergrad with my GPA, I personally got a 3.71. Any awards and scholarships that I received and my CV was already pretty packed so I actually didn't include leadership, leadership positions that I held in college, but you can add that if you want as well. The section was pretty short for me and it's going to be short unless you have a master's already. And after that, I have my work experiences. Now this is going to be a huge chunk of your first page. I personally have five work experiences. Two are summer internships and three are long-term positions. For my two summer internships, I worked at two separate academic labs at Yale for a few months, which were amazing experiences. And I don't remember much about my time there because it was a freshman, but just getting experience in a lab helped me to get my first major work experience. And one question you may ask is, how did you get into a lab at Yale when you're a freshman with no work experience? And this is kind of where looking at your network, looking at your connections come into play. I personally don't have anyone in science that could help me out but my dad does construction. He ended up doing construction for some Yale professors. So he was able to put in a good word for me and then I was able to do an internship in their labs. So you don't necessarily even have to utilize the traditional network. You can utilize friends, family, coworkers, or other people that you may know who may actually be helpful in getting you into labs. So widen, widen your networks and just see what you can do to actually get opportunities and make those opportunities for yourself. Sometimes they're found in the most unlikely of places. What's going on on my phone? Is it Yale? No, it's not Yale. Is it Harvard? No, it's Grace. Who's Grace? My roommate. My roommate's moving with me to New York. She'll be on a video soon. We're gonna sing together. Throughout college, I worked at a major neuroscience lab at Harvard. Now, take note, I did not go to Harvard for my undergrad. Even if your undergraduate school doesn't have labs that you're interested in, look for other opportunities. Reach out to people, make connections, and put yourself out there, and you'll find yourself in a great position to succeed. And my time at Yale was actually very helpful into getting me my lab at Harvard. And this is where expanding your network really comes into play. If you're able to get into a good lab, utilize your networks at that lab to help you get your following positions, help you get other positions once you're already graduated. These people really want to fight for you if you're going to put in the time, the effort. Now, this lab that I was at at Harvard was a very postdoc heavy lab. This means that there's a lot of people working on a lot of different projects. And what I did during my two years in that lab was to work under as many postdocs as possible. I had my main postdoc mentor that I did most of my work with, but in my spare time, I learned techniques from others in the lab. I started relationships with them, asked them for advice, and helped them out with their research if I could. I became an active member of the lab community. And at the same time, I worked really hard on my technical skills. I would practice every new technique until I became an expert at it, or at least as much of an expert that an undergraduate can be. And as you show technical mastery and produce top quality results that are both repeatable and reliable, more people will ask you to help them out with their own research. So what happens when you collaborate with more people and get involved in more projects? When those projects eventually get published, or hopefully get published, you'll be on those papers. And after two years of working in this academic lab, I got on seven papers, some of which were second author publications. I have a few nature papers, although I'm a, a middle author on those, and some pretty good impact papers as well. I got on posters, talks that my postdoc presented at. These publications, posters, talks, are the tangible results of my success in the lab. Now the admissions committees will see your publications, posters, and talks as evidence that you can do independent research, especially if you have high authorship. And although I have a good amount of papers, I actually don't have any first author papers. It's not a requirement to get into great programs, but if you're able to secure first author papers or any other authorship papers, it will really boost your competitiveness in applications. And you may be wondering, wait, Bianca, how did you get on so many papers? That seems completely unrealistic. <laughs> and to that, I'll answer yes and no. Some of it comes down to luck. 
I just happened to join at the tail end of my postdoc's tenure in the lab, which meant that she was trying to publish the work she's done for the last few years. I also joined a postdoc heavy lab that published a lot. That first point we can't really control, but we can look up the publication history of labs and see if there would be potential to publish. The third reason I was able to get on so many projects is that I worked hard. I worked a lot. I had the opportunity to do two six month full time internships in the lab during undergrad. 40 hours a week for one year is a huge advantage in terms of experiences that you can do, people that you can work with, people that you can present to, projects that you can work on. I also worked part-time during my class semesters. And by part-time, I mean that when I wasn't actively in class, I was in the lab. I did homework while my experiments were running. I stayed super late very regularly. These were not expectations, but I volunteered because I was interested in learning more and getting more experiences. You don't need to go as hard as I did, but the level of effort that you put will show in your current and future opportunities. Not everyone can do what I did. Not everyone has the opportunity to work full time for a year during undergrad. So temper your own expectations if that's not the reality of your situation. And actually a lot of the, the admissions committees for a lot of these schools say that their average um, amount of research time that their matriculant, uh, matriculants, is that the word? The people that are matriculating have is around a year and a half of research experience. So although I have way more than a year and a half of experience, it's not the expectation for you to have a crazy amount of research experience prior to matriculating into your program. And it's also okay if you don't have my quote unquote stats. Many people in my cohort also don't have my quote unquote publication record. Maybe they have one or two, maybe they don't have any. And that doesn't matter as much as showing your drive, your passion, ability to do independent research. I was lucky to get into the lab that I did and I used that opportunity to the best of my ability. Do that for whatever opportunity you have and you'll succeed. Now, after my academic tenure, I swapped over into industry. I sold out, if you want to say it like that, although I don't really agree with that statement. But I wanted to see if a long-term academic career or a pharmaceutical position was more suited for my own interests. And the pay is actually better in industry, so maybe maybe a little bit of that sell-outness. I stayed two years in a small biotech company studying Alzheimer's disease, and then I swapped over to a larger biotech company studying ALS for another two years at the time of my application. So in total, four years of industry alongside two years of academic research prior to applying. I learned a ton of new techniques, presentation skills, program proposal and development, and just how to be more independent in my research. And one thing to note is that industry can be a different type of research for a lot of admissions committees. It's pretty hard to publish while in pharmaceutical companies. Even if your experiences and your work are more independent in nature, it can be hard to show committees that, especially if the work done is confidential and you can't talk about it. And when I wrote about my industry work in, the, in my CV, I had to emphasize the underlying disease mechanisms of the assays that I developed and performed to show that I wasn't just doing the same assay over and over again. I wasn't just a pair of hands, but I was actively involved in the development of the disease hypothesis that the assays were established upon. It's a different focus. Industry can prioritize things that academia may not prioritize and vice versa. And that's okay, it's just different. So if you're applying to academic institutions like graduate programs, you need to frame your industry experiences or any experiences that you have from an academic perspective. Why? Program fit. We're back to that point about fit because it's super important. From my CV, what do you think it seems like I prioritize? Two years in academic lab, four years in industry. Yes, I have some amazing work from the academic lab in the form of papers, posters, and talks. Very fortunate for that. But I still have way more experience in industry. So it's possible that many committees may view my CV and think that I want a future career in industry, even if I tailored my industry sections to be more academic in nature. And that's kind of what happened with me. I applied to programs that I thought and my mentors thought based on my CV and my publication record that I would be a shoe in to at least get an interview. Maybe not get in, but at least go to the interview. But that didn't happen. This cycle, I applied to Harvard, MIT, and UPenn and got ghosted from all three of them. Why? Well, I don't actually think I was a particularly good fit considering my interests in industry. It's true that I want to go back into industry and 
Committees are smart. They know that from my CV. If a school can't provide you with the opportunities that you need to succeed, they're not going to accept you. And now I have no idea why I got ghosted from these schools in particular. There are definitely faculty members that collaborate with industry at all the programs I listed. And maybe I got rejected for a different reason, but clearly I wasn't a good fit. Whether it was my industry background or something else, or maybe I wasn't qualified enough and that's okay. There's still amazing programs with amazing faculty and amazing opportunities. So what school did I get accepted into? Columbia and WashU and a couple of others, which are both top 10 neuroscience programs. Why? And I actually found out during my interviews that both schools either have or are trying to grow their industry presence. They're interested in the intersectionality between disease biology and pharmaceutical treatments, especially with universities that have clinicians with patients and are looking for treatments to currently incurable diseases. What does my CV show? an intersectionality between neurodegenerative biology and pharmaceutical methods to treat it. I fit better at these schools, and that's probably one of the reasons why I was accepted. And during my interviews and when I visited the schools in person, I was actually asked about my industry research a lot. Why do I want to go back to grad school when I can probably climb the ladder in industry, especially considering the severe pay cut? How does this thing work in industry? How do you connect a disease mechanism to a patient? I am not an expert in these things, but the schools that I got acceptances from have the opportunities to help me become an expert. And that's the main point of this video. Do the best that you can with any and all opportunities you have at your disposal. But remember that fit in a program matters just as much as your tangible qualifications on a CV. Don't get too hung up on programs that ghosted you because you may be surprised at how well another program fits your interests and will help you get to amazing places in the future. You can succeed and you will succeed if you put in the effort. And Maybe you may not have as many opportunities as someone else, but you can do really well in the places that you are at right now. You can succeed in the places that you're at right now and utilize your connections to help open doors for other avenues as well. So we all got this. If you're applying now, or I guess this upcoming fall, good luck. If you have questions, put it, put it in the chat, I'll try, or the comments, I'll try to answer them. I may not have all the answers, but I'll do my best. We'll see how that works. But yeah, be kind to yourself, do the best that you can, but it's, it's okay, <laughs> it's really okay. So yeah, but that was this, this week's video. If you like my content, um, please give me a like, comment, share, and subscribe. Consider joining my Patreon if you're interested. It's a little bit different content, but it's more, mostly about me learning languages, but maybe I can incorporate some more of my grad school experiences into the Patreon as well. But yeah, I hope you stick around for any other videos. Let me know if you want more videos about my science career or maybe more videos about New York, New York in general. Um, and I'll sprinkle that in alongside my other normal content about language learning. But yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your day and I will see you guys later. Bye-bye.